Genesis chapter 1. My text for this evening is verse 15 to verse, well I put 19, but really it's to verse 17 we're going to look at tonight, because we're going to come back and look at verse 18 and 19. So let's say verse 15 to 17 is my text this evening. We're looking together at Paul's letter to the Colossians. Remember the big theme is the supremacy of Christ. You have that at the end of verse 18, that in all things, he may have the preeminence, the supremacy. I believe the, 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 the su- supremacy of Christ is the big theme, but also the sufficiency of Christ as well. We'll come to that in, in chapter 3 and chapter 4. So let's continue then with the supremacy of Christ. What have we seen? We've seen two things already. Uh, From verses 1 to 14, we've seen Christ's supremacy in the gospel, that he is supreme, the gospel is all about him. Indeed, the Bible gives him the preeminence. It's all about him. He opens up the scriptures and shows them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. And then we have Christ's supremacy over evil, over evil. Well, let's look at our text tonight. I'm going to read it from Colossians chapter 1. And verse 15. I'll read to verse 19. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. All the fullness should dwell. Let's just bow and pray before we really open this up together this evening. Lord, we thank you for your word then. It is a living word. It is sharper than any two-edged sword and it's powerful. And we thank you, Lord, tonight that as we come to it, we come to it in faith, believing it to be the word of God, not the words of men. And we come believing that you'll speak to us. But we ask, Lord, that you would help us. For we are truly looking at a glorious passage of Scripture And Lord, there are many in your word, but oh Lord, we pray that it would impact us, that it would affect us, that at the very least, Lord, it would increase our faith, and that our faith would grow tonight, even increase, and you would open our horizon, and you would show us what it means to believe in God, to believe in Christ, to trust in you, Lord. And to walk by faith and to live by faith. Your word says the just shall live by faith. And your word says without faith it is impossible to please God. So Lord increase our faith tonight. May we be doers of the word not just believers only. May we have that living faith tonight. We pray for ourselves Lord but we do pray for others. That they may be given grace to believe. We pray for our nation. At this time, Lord, we've seen the storms batter in this country, but what are they compared to the terrible day of the Lord? It is nothing compared to what you are going to do to this world. According to your word, Lord, you will shake the very foundations of this earth, and men will cry out. But Lord, we will be still and know that you are God. The Lord of hosts is with us. Oh, Lord, how we with you tonight. Are we for you? Are we living for you? Are we walking by faith and not by sight? Grant it to be so, Lord. For your name's sake we pray and for your glory. Grant us your Holy Spirit now as we come to your word. Open our eyes. Open our understanding. And grant us to know the height and the depth and the breadth of the knowledge of Christ. Oh, please, Lord, inflame our hearts, we pray. For your glory we ask it. Amen. So let's come to Colossians then. My text or my message, sorry, tonight 
in Colossians 1, 15 to 17, is Christ's supremacy over all creation. Really over everything, supremely everything, heaven and earth, all creation includes everything, not just this world, but the whole universe, the whole thing. Now we come to one of the great statements of the person of Christ. I would suggest it's the greatest statements on the person of Christ in the whole Bible. And we are on holy ground, therefore, in Colossians 1, verse 15 to 17. What an incredible statement it is. There's so much packed into so few verses. Well, let's, by God's help tonight, to try and unpack. I've got three headings, so let's break them down. First thing we want to see is this. Paul tells us, He is the image of the invisible God. Find that in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, what is God like? There's a question. Well, the answer the Bible gives is look at Jesus. God is like Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. No man has seen God at any time. But Jesus reveals God to man. The word image there is the exact representation. So when you're looking at Jesus, you're looking at God. You're seeing God. God revealed. God manifests as the Apostle Paul. God became a man and made himself known here in the person of Jesus Christ. The ultimate revelation of God is the person of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, And verse 6, do you remember these words? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, No man can come to the Father except through me. It's our text outside. Uh, Oh, listen to what what, what Jesus then says. If you had known, uh, uh, no one can come to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father else also. From now on, you know him. Listen to this. And I've seen him. And I've seen him. And Philip obviously wasn't paying attention, said, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. That'll be sufficient. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you've not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? From now on, you know him and have seen him. That's the point. Jesus is the exact representation of God. The image of the invisible God. In John chapter 1, that great statement of of the word became flesh. We read in verse 18 of that chapter, no one has seen God at any time. No one. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him or He has revealed Him. That's the picture. He's the image of the invisible God. I love what the writer, well, Paul, I believe, but it's, it's an anonymous epistle in that sense. But Hebrews chapter 1 says this, God, who at various times and in various different places, spoke in times past to our fathers through the prophets, Hebrews 1 verse 1. He says, as in these last days, spoken to us through his son. So he spoke through the prophets. Now he's spoken in a, a much more phenomenal way through his son. Who is he? Well, he's appointed heir of all things. We'll see that tonight. Through him, uh, whom he also made the worlds. That's in our message tonight. Who being the brightness of his glory is the image of the invisible God, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Why, when he by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's not an angel, he's arguing he's far greater than any angel. He is the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person. So people will come to you and say, well, why, why your religion? Why Christianity? What's so special about Jesus? What are you going to say? Well, you'll tell them. He's the image of the invisible God. He is God. He's the image of the invisible God. He is God with us. He is God manifest, revealed in the flesh. God with us. Jesus Christ is Lord. It was the 
the great early confession of faith of the early church that's in the Bible. Jesus Christ is God. That's what it means. Oh, what a statement that is. Jesus Christ is Lord. You can't get a better one than that. Well, he says it in, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. He's the image of the invisible God. But look what else he says. He's the firstborn over all creation. Now, this is a favorite verse of the cults, particularly the Jehovah's Witnesses. They love this verse because they'll say he's just the firstborn. So they argue like this, he's just a creation or a creature created by God. He's the first, he's not God. No, no, this, this verse doesn't teach that at all. That's a complete uh, error, of course, because it doesn't fit in with any of Scripture in the Bible. No, look at this statement, firstborn. The firstborn in the Bible is the firstborn son. Always. The first, the elder son, the elder brother, the firstborn. The first of many, it means. And the Bible calls the son, remember, the son is called Emmanuel, God with us. The son of God. God manifest in the flesh. He's the first, says Paul, of a new creation. He's the head of the body, the church. Verse 18, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence. He's the first to rise from the dead. He's the first. He, he has literally taken human nature. He has died, uh, joined his nature to ours, then lived a perfect life for man, then died on the cross, and he has risen from the dead. He's conquered the grave. He's the firstborn from the dead. The first to rise with a glorified body. And all who are in Christ will follow the same way. Read 1 Corinthians 15. In the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will be raised first with glorified bodies. God's people, they are called the sons of God. He's the elder brother. He's the first. And he's the first. And they also, the word firstborn means the one who's going to inherit everything. That's what it means. The right of inheritance. He's going to inherit it all. The firstborn over all creation. All we'll see tonight show, show, is clearly taught in these verses is, is Christ. It's his. It, by inheritance, it belongs to him. He owns it. He made it all. It's all for him. No, Jesus is God. He's the image of the invisible God. In that very verse, how can you say he's a creature? He's the image of the invisible God. He's God with us. God revealed to man. We sing it, don't we, at Christmas time, the, the carols. And now we, we love to sing them. But do you remember the words of, of Charles Wesley's great carol? Hark the herald angels sing. Let me quote you a, a verse. Christ by highest heavens adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. There he is. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel, God with us. He's the image of the invisible God. He's the express image of his person. He's the exact representation of God. Now, can you see what Paul is doing? Can you see what he's after? He's trying to teach us the supremacy of Christ. If that is the case, you can see his supremacy over everything. No, Jesus isn't one amongst many. You can't categorize him like that. You can't put him amongst the prophets. You can't put him amongst the teachers, religious leaders. No, no. He's supreme. He is God. He's the image of the invisible God. God revealed to man. That's the first and great statement he makes about Christ. But then he moves on. He tells us that he is the creator of all things. Verse 16, the next verse. For by him all things were created. That's all things. That are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether the thrones and dominions, principalities and powers. So you see he's, he's speaking about the spiritual, invisible world, as well as the natural, created world, the visible world. All things were created through him and for him. 
Now, I'm not going to waste time tonight on speaking against or arguing the difference between creation and evolution. It's simply clear, isn't it? A Christian can't accept that because the Christian says he believes the Bible and the Bible is clearly basic on this. In the beginning, it begins this way. What? In the beginning, God created, created the heavens and the earth. It's an antithesis of that theory. Everything, though the Bible says goes further than that, says was created by Jesus. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? Oh, he's given uh, the God that are involved and doubted, the Father and the Holy Spirit, but he's given the preeminence. The focus of the New Testament especially is on him. There is a reason, and we'll see it tonight, why he's given the preeminence. Christ, we're told in the Bible, is creator of everything. John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, verse 1 of chapter 1. And the Word was not a God, the Word was with God. And the Word was God. No indefinite article in the Greek, no A. They put it in, the Jehovah's Witnesses. He was God. He is God and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. What does that mean? He, being the Son of God, was with God the Father. That's what it means. But listen, about him now, all things were created through him, through Christ. And without him, Jesus, nothing was made that was made. How about that? You can't get a more categorical statement. He was in the world, verse 10, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't know him. And it's still the same. Who is this Jesus? All things were created through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. The world was made through him. And in this Colossian statement, this magnificent statement about Christ in verse 16, he says, for by him... Listen to the words carefully. Meditate on them. By him, all things were created. All things. And then he covers them all, doesn't he? In heaven and on earth, visible, invisible. Thrones, dominions, principalities and powers, everything. All things were created by him. All things were created through him. What a statement that is. I mean... It's a breathtaking statement about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. You can't compare him with anyone else. All things were created, created through him. Through him. What about that? Without him, nothing was made that was made. Oh, Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, he upholds all things as well by the word of his power. He didn't only create it, he sustains it, he upholds it. Oh, in him, says Paul, we live, and we move, and we have our being, our, our total breath, our life. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. In him, that's the language of this verse. In him, by him, through him. He is God. He is creator. He, by his creative power, has made all these things. Now, notice the phrase that I believe he keeps wanting us to see. And he keeps saying it deliberately in verses 15, particularly to verse 19. He uses the word all things. Verse 16, for by him all things were created. Principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, verse 17, and in him all things consist. Can you see it? He's the head of the body, verse 18. We'll come to this verse. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, how many times has he got to say it? All things. He may have the preeminence, the the supremacy over everything. All things means everything, doesn't it? Everything. Things in heaven. Whatever you want to go down the list. We haven't got time. Angels, principalities, powers. Things on earth, everything you can see, everything you know. Visible, invisible. Thrones, dominions, principalities, all created things were all created through him and by him. Now, where do you go with that? All things. Everything. It's a staggering statement. And he is before verse 17. It's just like one breathtaking statement after another. Verse 17, and he is before all things. 
So he says, all things, all things were made by him. And he is before all things. Which is what 1 John 1 says. In the beginning was the word. He is before all things. In the beginning, God. That's what he's saying. He's declaring he is the eternal God. He is before all things and in him all things consist. We've already said he upholds all things. He is the eternal, everlasting God. That's what he's saying. Who is before all things. The Bible calls Jesus the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. All things were created by him. All things are upheld by him. I mean, what power we have here. What power. If this doesn't increase your faith in Jesus, then there isn't anyone else going to be able to do it anywhere else in the Bible. If you're looking for a verse in the Bible that will strengthen your faith and say, well, give me more faith, Lord, in you. This is it. Where do you go with this? Everything. All things. What supreme power Jesus Christ has. What glorious power. Power, what a glorious person he is. Listen to this staggering statement in Ephesians chapter 4. If you want to turn to it or listen to it, Ephesians 4, he says this in verse 8. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, he gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Christ's humiliation first. First he became a man and then he humbled himself even to the death of the cross. And then he rose from the get dead and then he ascended into heaven. Listen, he who descended, listen to verse 10. He who descended is also the one who ascended. Now listen to this, far above all the heavens. This is an incredible statement. Far above all the heavens that he might fail all things. How about that? I mean, it's there, it's in the Bible, that he who has ascended now, this Jesus Christ, might fill all things. It takes my breath away, it should take your breath away, that he might fill all things, that Christ is not only before all things, that's incredible, he's not only the eternal God, but he says he fills all things. He not only made everything, he not only existed before he made everything, but he now fills it all. You see, he's not only eternal, he's not only the everlasting eternal God, he's the infinite God, without measure. You can't measure him, without measure. Yes, he's become a man, our God, constructed to a span, incomprehensibly made man, but he fills everything. Without measure, without limit. You remember Solomon, what did he say when he built that temple? He said, this temple that I've built is big enough for you. Even the heavens, the universe can't contain you. You're so vast. Oh, listen, God fills all his creation. And that's Jesus Christ. There's no place where he is not present. Can you imagine that tonight? The infinite universe we talk about. Psalm 139 indicates, where can I go from your presence? And this is just planet Earth. If I go to the end of the Earth, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. He fills, he fills all things. Get your head around it. It's not the, error, the heresy of pantheism that, that God and his creation are one. So, you know, if you're looking at a tree, that's God. You know, God is in the person. The person is God. That's a kind of new age pantheism as well. Everything is not God. No, no. Creation is separate to the creator. God, but he is in all his creation. He is part of it. He is everywhere present. But not he. He is not the creation. Don't misunderstand the two. He can be everywhere. He can fill it all. But he's not a tree. He's not the sun. He's not the moon. He's separate from it. But he is everywhere. Do you get the difference? He is everywhere. He is in that sense in all his creation. There is no part of the universe where you could go tonight if you could travel there and you can't get there because it's too vast that Christ does not fill it. That's how big Jesus Christ is. That's how immense and supreme he is. 
We cannot big him up too much. He feels, he feels all things, and all things mean all things to the Apostle Paul, to the Word of God. And so if you're looking at the universe, well, that would blow my mind. Let's just stay with planet Earth. Oh, the birds and the trees and the flowers and the animals. I've been up in the Lake District at the weekend, see the, the mountains and the snow cap, oh, the lakes. He fills it all. Do you see, when you look at these things, do you see Christ who fills all this? The earth is the Lord's, it says, and the fullness, and the fullness of it. The whole earth is full, full of his glory. I'm asking you tonight, can you see it? Do you see Christ in his creation? David did. The heavens declare. He looked up at the sky and he saw the universe. The heavens declare the glory of God. Romans chapter 1 says his invisible attributes are clearly seen by the things that he has made. But man in sin refuses to acknowledge it, but it's clearly seen. He looks at the sunset, he looks at the sky and he says, oh, the mountains are beautiful. Oh, the beauty of nature. Yes. He likes Richard Attenborough, who doesn't. He loves to watch the nature programs and just to see the wonders of nature. But he doesn't see Christ. Do you? Do you see Christ? He doesn't see the creator. He, he fails to see the power of God. He doesn't see it. The invisible attributes reveal, clearly see. We saw it last week, the reason why. He can't do it because he's blinded. He's under the power of darkness. And he can't see. Oh, but if your eyes are open, you can see the glory of Christ. Christless eyes have never seen these things. Oh, we see that all things are created by him and through him. He's not only the creator of all things that he might even fill. He's not only before all things, he fills all things. Oh, what a truth that is. Now, listen, the final truth is the most staggering of these verses. Let me give you the heading. All things were created for him. How about that? For him. Listen to this. Or listen to what he says. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones and dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things consist. Yes, in all things he may have the preeminence. But did you catch that line at the end? Or we just read through it. I did that deliberately. We just read through it. All things, yes, all things, all things. You've said that. Listen. All things were created through him. And this is the bit we miss. And for him. And for him. That's the most staggering part of these verses. And for him. Don't you see the incredible supremacy of Christ there? It's one thing to say, and we've said it already, that Christ created all things. But to be told that all things were created for him, that's infinitely more incredible to me. Oh, the supremacy of Christ. He created everything by him, through him. All things were created. Incredible it is. But do you see how glorious it is when he just adds at the end of that verse, all things were created for him, for him. That really is incredible. Why did God create the world? He had a purpose, he had a plan. Do you know his purpose? Do you know his plan? Why did he create the world? For man? Did he create it for us? We come in there, but that wasn't the supreme plan and purpose. What was his ultimate purpose why does the world exist tonight? Why is there a planet Earth? Why is there a universe? The Bible's answer is staggering. It's all for Christ. It's all made for Him. It's all for Jesus. It's all, everything, all for Him. It was made through Him. It was made by Him. It was made, He says, for Him. And that, to me, is an incredible thing. All things were created through him and for him. It's almost like, you know that verse in Genesis? Oh, and he made the stars also, by the way. Just add that on. Just a little tiny addition. Oh, did I not tell you? It was made, oh, for him as well. 
Just add that one and I'll just slip that one in. It's an incredible statement. It's all his, you see. It's all been given to him. It all belongs to him. He rules and he reigns right now over everything. He has supremacy over everything. When Wesley said, Jesus, the name I overhaul, the Bible is saying it. It means it. When Ephesians describes Jesus' supremacy in chapter 4, when he it says that he fills all things, what about chapter 1 and verse 21? Far above, this is Jesus, all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Paul makes sure he covers every corner, of every facet of it. There's nothing you cannot miss out here. I've covered everything. Christ is far above all that lot. Every name that's named, every power and principality. You can't get more supreme than Jesus. You can't. Even God the Father has given him the preeminence. He's given him a name that's above every other name. And the Bible says he made it all. He owns it all. He rules it all. And he reigns over it all. What a staggering statement. I don't know if you're thrilled with it as much as I am. It's all for him. It's all for him. Let me put it like this. What I see in this passage is this. So staggering the truth. There is no purpose to this world other than Christ. How about that? You know, if somebody said there is no Jesus, you might as well just go out and die. I mean that. I mean that literally. Literally, there is no purpose to life if there is no Jesus Christ. He's the source. He's the fountain. He's everything. But more than that, he's the purpose of life. People are looking for purpose. They want meaning to life. They'll never find it without Christ. He's the purpose of this world. It's all for him. The New Testament keeps on telling us to him, through him, by him, in him, to him be the glory forever and ever. So you see, there's some logic to this now. You can apply some basic logic. If that is the case, and it, and it certainly truly is, the word of God is true, then you can make some obvious conclusions. For example, what's the purpose of life? Well, the catechism says the chief end of man is to glorify God. We're made by God and for God. To glorify God is to glorify Christ because he is the image of the invisible God. And it's all to him be the glory. So in order to live right, in order to find your purpose in this world, you're to live for Christ. That's it. In a nutshell. That simple. Nothing else to look for. Don't need anything else. Sufficiency goes with supremacy. Paul says, for me, life is Christ. To live is Christ. The goal, according to my Bible and your Bible, of all creation is Christ. The aim, God's purpose. If you have Christ, you'll know eternal life. You'll know God. To know Christ is to know God. And the purpose is to live for Christ. What about the future of mankind? What about the future of this world? What does the Bible say? Well, it tells us the kingdom of God. That's the, one of the great themes of the Bible. The coming kingdom. The kingdom that's here now. The kingdom that's coming in all its fullness. The new heavens, the new earth. But who's the king? Of this kingdom. There's only one king of the kingdom in the Bible and it's Christ. Jesus Christ is king. Christ is king. Cromwell said it. Christ, not man, is king. He's the only king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he, says the Bible, shall reign how long for? Forever. Forever. And of his kingdom, there'll be no end. There'll be no end. Why? Because he's before all things. Because he's the Alpha and the Omega. Because he's the first and the last. Because he's the beginning and the end. You just read the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, how Jesus 
you know, it is manifested off the pages of Scripture, how he speaks as he, as he reveals himself to John on that Isle of Patmos. How does he speak to him? Listen to this. He says, Jesus, the faithful witness, the first, here it is again, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How many times the Bible says that? Behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. And those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. It ends with even so, come Lord Jesus. And Jesus speaks and says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. First and last letters of the Greek alphabet. I'm the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come. The Almighty, the Almighty. He is God, without a doubt. I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation of kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, I was on the Isle of Patmos, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. How we need to be in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard a voice, a loud voice, like a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, what you see right in this book. What a staggering revelation it is. Do you remember the end of it? Revelation 22, the end of the Bible. What does Jesus say? Some of the last words of the Bible, Revelation 22 and verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You see, the picture the Bible gives is Jesus coming again in order to claim his kingdom, to claim his inheritance. He's the firstborn. And can you see how glorious the picture presents of Christ in all the fullness, in all the revelation that he is supreme in all things? And can you now see, to sum this up, how practical all this is? Because I believe the Bible is very practical. You know, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, we've already mentioned it already in this series, but we'll come to the verse, to them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. He's revealed it to us among the Gentiles, which is what? Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Look what he says in chapter 3. Let's have a taste. If you then being raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds not on things of the earth. Oh, listen, set your minds on things above. You died and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, what about this for a statement, who is our life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. When we see him, we'll be like him, we'll be glorified. So the, the practical nature of this, if I say I believe all this stuff that you've preached tonight, I believe in Jesus Christ. I am actually acknowledging something. I'm actually saying I believe that everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. So if you confess, when the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, it means something. I didn't just say I believe that Jesus. I used to be an unbeliever and used to, if you asked me, I, do you believe that Jesus? I'd say, yeah, I believe he's the son of God. But it didn't mean anything. It was just words. But if you really believe, you're in effect saying everything belongs to him and it's all for him. And you acknowledge that. Paul can say, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I'm not my own, says Peter. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a prize. I, I, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ. I live, he says, but no longer for myself. I live for him who died and rose again for me. I live for the one who loved me, he says in Galatians, and gave himself for me on that cross. We've just proclaimed it at the Lord's table tonight. And we've just read in Colossians 3, Christ who is our life will appear. How do I know I'm going to be saved on that day? Because Christ will have had to be in your life. For me to live is Christ. He is your life. He's your everything. This is so basic. It's almost 
shall we say, nursery class Christianity, and yet it's almost forgotten today. The Bible's black and white on this. It's not complicated. It's very simple. The doctrine that we've looked at tonight separates all mankind into two groups. You're in one or the other. You know the groups, the sheep and the goats, the lost and the saved, those who aren't Christians, who are lost and without Christ, and those who are Christians who are in Christ. Christ in them, the hope of glory. Those, in other words, who live for this world or live for themselves and those who live for Christ. I mean, that could not be more black and white, could it not? More simple. I'm either living for myself or I'm living for Christ. You can't tag a bit of Christianity onto your life and call that Christianity and say, I'm living for Christ, but really I live for myself, but I've got Jesus on a Sunday. That's a nonsense, isn't it? to this glorious truth. You either live for Christ or you live for yourself. Those who hold on to Jesus to their life in this world and those who have become Christians really have got hold of the teaching of Christ have lost their life. They've given it up. They've surrendered it. They belong to Christ. I'm not my own. I'm Christ. Because it was all his in the first place. And it all is his, his. The greatest sin man can commit is self. It's my way. It's my life. I live for themselves and not for Christ. And yet you belong to him and you're not your own. And you're living in his world and in his inheritance. And you're using everything that belongs to him. It's called sin. When you repent of your sin, you acknowledge Christ is supreme. Lord of all. As we often quote... Um, the preacher who said, I can't remember his name now, he's just gone, the guy who preached at the opening of this church, he basically said, if Jesus Christ spoke to him and said, if, if the Lord is not Lord of all, he won't be Lord at all. I'm either Lord of all, or not, F.B. Meyer it was, Lord of all or not at all. That's it, black and white. He's not just God, is he? He's the image of the invisible God. He's not even just the image of the invisible God. He's the creator of all things. But he's not even just the creator of all things. To a Christian, all things were created for him. For him. And that means they're the ones who come to see that the meaning of life and the purpose of life is really simplified in one word, Christ. That's the purpose. That's the meaning. That's why... This passage of Colossians is so glorious because it puts Christ in his rightful place. Can you see it? Paul goes straight to the center of the universe and puts Christ there. It's he's, he's through him and by him and for him. In him all things consist. He even says it, but that this was the purpose of it all, that, in, that, that all things, in all things, in everything, he would have supremacy. He would be preeminent. So let's close by asking some questions. Is Jesus that to you tonight? That's it really, isn't it? Is he that to you? Can you say he's Lord over all? Because if he's Lord over all, he's Lord over you. Can't opt out of this. Is he Lord over you? That's the point. Are you living in the kingdom of Christ? Are you living in submission to Christ? You know, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? But you don't live in submission to me. You don't do the things that I say. You do what you want to do. So many people say they believe in Jesus. They confess him with their lips. They say he's Lord. They say he's God. They say he's creator. But the question they've got to face is, is he ruling? Is he reigning over them? Jesus, for many Christians, sad to say it, He's nothing more, well, he's very, he's, let's bring him down to the level we've brought him. What have we made him today? We've made him, I'll tell you what we've made him. We've not made him a king. We've not made him a, a sovereign king. We've made him like Queen Victoria II. You're going to celebrate a great jubilee this year. What's she? She's a queen, is she not? No, she's a constitutional monarch. 
She's just the puppet figurehead, really. The power is at number 10, isn't it? She doesn't have much power. She doesn't reign. And although we sing, long to reign over as God save our gracious queen. Thank God for the queen. But she's not even a proper monarch. She's a constitutional monarch. What am I saying that for? Not to criticize our monarchy, but to say that's what many people have Jesus like. He's not only a, not a king, he's just a constitutional monarch in their lives. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that you acknowledge, like Queen Victoria is queen, but he has no power. A Jesus that has no power, a one who has power over everything, but he has no power over you, no authority over you. Oh, how many of us live in a world that has a Jesus like that. A Jesus who's been robbed of his supremacy. There's only one Jesus according to the Bible. And that isn't Jesus, is it? That's a false Jesus. You're going to be deceived and deluded into thinking you've got the real Jesus at that day. You must have the true Jesus. The supreme, supreme Jesus. Who is supreme over everything. And that means you. You must make that decision. If you're a backsliding Christian, you must make that decision. He must reign. He must reign over all. Because he has supremacy over all creation. And you see the great sin of mankind? Can you see it now? How clear it is? All you're doing is choosing not to submit to Christ and come under his supremacy. He's supreme over all his creation. And yet, as the biter to the psalmist and in Hebrew says, we do not yet see all things under him yet. One day we will. One day every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, but it will be too late for the majority. The Lord isn't forcing you to submit to him. He's giving you the clear picture that that's the way it's got to be. It's got to come voluntarily from you. You've got to be able to say like C.T. Stud, if Jesus Christ is God and died for me, there's no sacrifice, no submission. I can make this too great to him. How are you going to communicate the gospel to this world? How are you going to do it? If you're a Christian, you've got to communicate the gospel. Ever since the dawn of history, man has been seeking for answers. And here we are, the 21st century now. What's the issue of issues? Oh, man has been philosophizing over the purpose of this world and the reason why we're here. He still wants an answer. He's still seeking it. What's the primary cause of the universe? We look at it in philosophy when Paul deals with the philosophies of men. What's the cause? They still think those questions. A big bang? Well, we can say, but who caused the bang? You know, they don't have the answer. They haven't found an answer. What's the purpose of life? The most basic philosophical question of mankind. What is the purpose and the meaning of life? And if you accept the philosophies today, you've got to be able to say to them, they have no purpose, those philosophies. They're meaningless and pointless. Oh, contrast that with the Bible. How marvelous is the Bible? Christ is the primary cause of the universe. Christ is the primary purpose of the world. Listen to this. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, with the thrones of dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him. All things consist. Oh, listen, all things were created through him. I love it. Through him and for him. What a statement that is. Let me close with some words that we're going to sing. Listen to these words. He says, all oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. That's what we're going to do. We're going to sing to close this service tonight. All oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. You can crown him tonight. Crown him Lord of all. Oh, crown him Lord of all. Listen to these last two verses. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, on this planet, to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. 
Oh, that with yonder sacred throng, we, we now at his feet may fall. Oh, we need to fall down at the feet of the majesty and the glory of Jesus Christ tonight and join in the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that in all things, in all things, you are to have the preeminence. Blessed be your name. Amen. Let's sing to close our worship. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Crown him. Crown him Lord of all. It'll be a big hymn to sing tonight, but we have got a we've got the music, so we're fine. Amen. Let's lift our voices. Amen.